Some of y'all never been down south too much. I'm gonna tell you a little story so that you'll understand what I'm talking about. Down there we have a plant that grows out in the woods and the fields. And it looks something like a turnip green. And everybody calls it poke salad. And that's poke salad. Poke. Elvis sang about it. Gardeners loathe it. Old timers grew up on it. Suburban moms are afraid of it and pull it out with gloves. And, well, foragers, they're inconsistent about it. It's a miracle cure. It's a deadly poison, a nutritious food, a pest, a gift. It's pokeweed. This hotly contested, rich, historied, delicious plant is Philotaca americana, also called poke, polk, pigeonberry, garget, and skok. In all of my foraging forays, I'm pretty sure there's no plant that offers more food potential while being sidelined by modern figure and sheer ignorance than this particular plant. And that's a real shame. Now that I understand it, I look forward to cooking and eating pokeweed every year. I want to share how to identify, understand, safely cook, and truly enjoy this seasonal gift. First, I'll talk about how to forage for and enjoy this plant as the food it actually is. Then, after we've given pokeweed a moment to speak for itself, we'll talk about the loads and loads of conflicting information out there. You ready for a long foraging foray? Let's go. And that's poke salad. You may not know pokeweed by name, but if you live in its ample range, you'll know it by sight, guaranteed. This opportunistic plant will grow on pretty much any disturbed ground or floodplain, and can be found in the sandy, well-draining soil of backyards, parking lots, forest edges, fields, fence lines, and trails. I find it springing out of my garden and growing out around the barn, and most of all, growing out of areas where there's been construction. Even the crummiest soil isn't too poor for pokeweed. I have found it happily thriving in hard-packed subsoil where nothing else is even trying. If you draw a line up from Texas through to mid-Nebraska and then back east, you can see most of pokeweed's native range. In our modern times, pokeweed has traveled west and settled along the western coastline as well. Pokeweed is a perennial native plant that grows from a massive underground root. That huge amount of stored up energy underground gives it the ability to put out an impressive amount of quick above ground growth once spring has sprung. The spring shoots have two distinctive red lines that extend down from either side of each leaf base. There are often multiple shoots coming up from each root. The leaves are smooth, hairless, and simple. Now those spring shoots quickly transform into a tropically huge, thick-stemmed behemoth with wide alternate leaves and racemes of white, white five-petaled flowers. Those petite flowers soon grow into a cluster of black, shiny berries. Many plants grow more than six feet tall with multiple stems clustered together. The older the plant, and they can be decades old, the more stems it'll send out. In the fall, the frost-sensitive plant will die with the onset of cold weather. The stems usually dry out and fall over throughout the course of the winter, often laying prostrate on the ground like bones once the thaw reveals them. They're a great way, however, to identify potential picking spots for the spring. Just follow the stems to where they still connect with their hibernating root and watch. Once warm weather returns, green growing life will emerge from the roots like it had always been there. The name pokeweed comes from the Algonquin word pokone, which translates to red dye. The berries are the source of that distinction. And for those interested, we have an article on insteading about how to transform the color-rich berries into a wonderful ink. For the purposes of this video, however, it's not the inedible berries we're interested in, nor the poisonous root, nor the toxic mature plant. It's the delicious spring shoots. They are the only edible part of the plant, but boy, are they edible. They bear little resemblance to the full-grown monster they'll become in midsummer, but in the spring, they're a seasonal treat for anyone knows how to collect them. Once pokeweed is in its full-grown glory, there's really nothing else that looks like it. I mean, what other plant do you know that's 10 feet tall, has huge leaves, otherworldly stems, and a bright fuchsia pink and dangling clusters of jet black shiny berries? But as you just heard, full-grown pokeweed isn't usable for food. The shoot is what we're looking for, and when it's still a mere shoot, those shaky in their identification may confuse it with some other plants. When I was first learning how to identify pokeweed, for example, I found it easy to confuse it with dogbane. Dogbane is a toxic plant that sends up a similar spring shoot at the exact same time as pokeweed, and often in this exact same habitat. Thankfully, as I learned, and as you will see, there are some obvious differences between the two. 
Once you know pokeweed well, you'll never confuse them. So take the time to learn both plants before you progress to harvesting and eating poke greens. The first distinction is that dog mane has opposite leaves that grow in pairs across from the other. Pokeweed has alternate leaves. Second, dogbane produces a white milky latex when broken. If plucked after a spring rain, the sap may actually dribble out of the broken stem. Pokeweed shoots break cleanly and produce no sap. So take a look at these two plants. Can you tell the difference? Even without breaking them, you should clearly see the difference in leaf orientation. We've got alternate-leaved pokeweed and opposite-leaved dogbane. Pokeweed offers all the satisfaction of growing a domesticated food plant in terms of the sheer amount it offers, but it does so without cultivation or care. I can often collect a massive basket load of prime poke greens in under 10 minutes, shattering any notion that wild foods are scanty, hard collect, or don't offer real nutrition. In the mid and late spring, I eat poke greens at least once or twice a week. Harvesting the shoots encourages the plant to put out more and more to compensate for the lack, and it gives you about a full month's harvesting time, at least. As summer finally heats up, most of the plants start growing faster than I can pick them. So when I finally let them grow to maturity, it's with a fond farewell. So that said, let's talk about how to know when pokeweed is prime for picking. Poke shoots are safe to pick when they are meristematic. That is, when they're immature and still growing. A meristem is the zone of a plant that is actively still dividing and growing. It's young growth, tender, easy to bend, and easy to break. You may see plants putting out meristems in spring as they push out new stems and leaves. Even if meristem is an unfamiliar term, you've likely encountered them before. Asparagus is eaten as a meristem. I'd wager that many adults who have dined on asparagus regularly wouldn't be able to identify the feathery seven foot tall adult form. Now meristematic poke has a few attributes you need to learn. First, the leaves point upward, still unfurling. Second, the leaves feel tender and are often crinkled and wavy. They're not completely grown out yet. Third, the stem is flexible, bends easily, and snaps apart with a watery, clearish interior. The stems are usually green and may have a slight blush if they're in the sun. Poke in that stage is perfect. Poke that's too mature to harvest looks vastly different. The leaves are large, flat, and point horizontally outward or down. The stem is rigid, it doesn't bend easily. When broken, the stem is full of segments that aren't translucent or watery looking. The stem has also turned a pinkish, reddish, or bright fuchsia color. Don't harvest pokeweed at that stage. Sometimes, if the base of a shoot is too far gone, the branch tips may still be good to pick. Tops of branches that are still tender, bend easily, and have leaves pointing up and obviously not at full size may be perfect for harvest. Likewise, some shoots that are shade-grown may be surprisingly large, yet still tender and growing. Basically, you'll have to learn as you go. The plant is variable, depending on where it grows. As you increase in your knowledge of pokeweed, you'll start developing an instinctive knack for when shoots are good or aren't good to pick. Take the time to build up that familiarity. Now with many plants, you can make multiple harvests through the spring as the underground root pushes out new growth alongside the snapped stems. Eventually, the season will probably catch up with you and the pokeweed will start to mature too much to harvest. My general rule is that once pokeweed starts putting out flower buds somewhere on the plant, even if there's still a branch tip or two that's worth picking, I'll stop harvesting and let it complete its life cycle for the year. Since these are perennial plants that can last for decades, I want it to grow strong and live well through the summer and fall so that I can revisit it next spring. Now actually harvesting pokeweed is a simple endeavor. Find a suitable shoot, pull it until it snaps, put it in a basket. Sometimes the shoot will break off at the base where it joins with the root. When this happens, snap the pinkish root portion off until you get back to that juicy, easy to bend meristem again. Here's something else you need to know. Pokeweed is never eaten raw. It needs to be processed before it's eaten. More on that soon. The most important thing to know about cooking poke is how to cook it properly. Pokeweed has been an important food for hundreds of years, and because of that, it's often referred to by some rather archaic language. A dish of safely prepared pokeweed is often referred to as poke salad or a poke salad. This is not the modern usage of salad, however. Salad or salad once meant a dish of cooked greens, and that's the case with pokeweed. Pokeweed should never be consumed raw, and the traditional preparations of these tasty shoots confirms that. In every case, on three different continents, 
pokeweed is boiled in one or two changes of water before it's consumed. So let's get into how to prepare my favorite spring green. Get your biggest pot and place the pokeweed shoots that you've plucked inside. If you ended up with any really big ones, you can slice the stems into medallion shapes and add them to the pot as well. Now, fill the pot with water. We're going to bring the first water to a complete boil, allow the shoots to boil for 5 to 10 minutes, then drain the water completely. You'll see that the water from the first boiling has become almost an acid green color. Now put the parboiled shoots back in the empty pot, cover with clean, cool water again, then bring it to boil a second time. The poke will have reduced significantly. Some say this second boiling is unnecessary, but others insist on at least three changes of water. I've found that two changes have produced a consistently good product, so this is my method. While the pot is heating to a boil the second time, heat up a skillet and fry an onion or two with a healthy knob of butter. Once the onions are fragrant and just browned, the poke in the pot should have reached boiling. With your trusty tongs, remove the pokeweed shoots from the boiling water, drain again, and add to the sizzling skillet. You'll see that the poke has a very soft texture at this point, but is still a wonderfully verdant green. Unlike many other vegetables, poke stays a bright colored green after all this processing, yet another appealing point in its favor. Once the poke has been fried for a few minutes, season with salt, pepper, or optional chili flakes, and serve alongside some good whole wheat bread or brown rice with a few fried eggs. As you tuck into this decadent, truly American dish, you'll find that poke has an agreeably gentle flavor, no trace of bitterness, and a soft texture that's hard to describe, but easy to like. Poke? Tastes like poke! Early on in the season, it sometimes has a mild back of your throat spiciness that is similar to Szechuan peppercorns, but most of the time it's green, mild, and hearty. If ever the poke tastes bitter or gives you a burning mouth feeling, that either means you didn't parboil it thoroughly enough or you picked it too late in the season. I've never experienced this distaste, however, and following the guidelines I've given you, you shouldn't either. Now this recipe is simple. Of course, you can change up the spices, add meat, mix pokeweed greens with other greens once they're in a the skillet, but always make sure that you first boil and poke in two changes of water before you progress it to any other step. So you've gotten through this whole video so far, and if you've never heard of it before, you likely think pokeweed seems like a great plant to forage, cook, and eat. Just a few parboilings and you're feasting like kings, right? If you read foraging literature from the past, all authors would agree with you. Pokeweed was a poor man's staple, a traditional food of both Native Americans and Southerners, and popular enough that it was canned commercially and sold in stores. Here in the Ozarks, the Allen Canning Company was still selling it until 2000, and then they discontinued it due to lack of interest. Native Americans taught settlers how to eat the plant. It was so widely enjoyed and accepted that pokeweed was one of the many plants sent back across the pond. Fast forward to 1962 and you'll read Yule Gibbons write that pokeweed was the best known and most widely used wild vegetable in America. There was even an article in a 1979 issue of Mother Earth News that gave instructions on how to harvest poke for profit, collecting it for canning companies to give yourself a bit of side income. But something happened around the 80s and 90s, and in the decades that followed, the more modern foraging guides have been imposing unnecessarily strict harvesting rules to follow. Many guides advise to never eat shoots that are taller than six inches, and to never harvest plants that have any tinge of red on their stems. This is sometimes prohibitively conflicting information, however. Some shoots grown in direct sunlight are dangerously pink when under six inches tall, particularly the first shoots of the year and plenty of shoots well over six inches tall are green. As you can see from my own harvesting, almost every poke shoot I pick is bigger than six inches. Any that had a slight red to their stems, usually the ones growing in the direct sun rather than in the shade, I didn't really worry about. Any that were notably red or pink, something that coincides with being more mature and not tender, I didn't pick in the first place. That bright pink shows maturity that you want to avoid, but I'm still not personally convinced that the slight reddish tinge on an obviously tender meristem has much an effect after two boilings. You can make your own judgment call as you learn for yourself. Most of the poke shoots photographed for this article are from my first harvest of the year. Since there are no leaves on the trees yet, the first harvest is exposed to more sunlight and therefore slightly redder than later harvests in the shady late summer. I have eaten all the poke you've seen in this article with no problems. I suspect that in order to offer some standard for novice foragers and as well to avoid any liability, modern publishers have demanded a standard size and a standard color. 
The problem is, pokeweed doesn't know how to count in inches any better than it did in the 70s when most any size of meristem was considered safe. Understanding the somewhat flexible nature of that edible meristem requires understanding pokeweed itself. Online, it's even worse. If you want to scare yourself irrationally, just search foraging for pokeweed. After you read through the many blogs and articles that appear, you'll come away feeling that foraging for pokeweed is dangerous, as old-fashioned as bloodletting, and inadvisable for the wise. Truth is, many websites offer the dodgiest information I've found on any wild food. Some say that poke leaves can be eaten raw in a salad because it's called poke salad after all. I even read a write-up once that claims you can eat pokeweed when it has white berries but not blackberries. The guide unbelievably showed unopened flower buds as the white berries. All of those statements are wrong in various degrees of wrongness. So here again are three surefire keys to know when pokeweed is safe. Remember, I write this as someone who regularly harvests, cooks, and eats pokeweed when it's available. My claims are also backed up by Samuel Thayer's extremely well-researched and experience-based chapter on pokeweed in his book, Incredible Wild Edibles. Number one, never eat it raw. A few documented pokeweed po poisonings are directly connected to eating raw leaves, likely a misunderstanding of the old meaning of salad striking again. Number two, never eat the roots or berries. Many records of pokeweed poisonings are concerned with root and berry consumption, not the shoots. I've heard of medicinal uses of pokeweed root and berries, but if you don't know what you're doing, don't mess around with the roots or fruit. Number three, only eat tender meristematic growth. Remember the keys to identifying those quick growing meristems. The leaves are tender and delicate and also slightly ruffled looking since they haven't fully unfurled. They point upward rather than spreading out horizontally or pointing downward to catch the sunlight. The stems bend, snap, and break easily and are succulent and juicy since they're still in the middle of their huge push of spring growth. They are green or greenish and never fuchsia or pink. These factors, not shoot height, are the important keys for shoot safety. So is pokeweed toxic? Yes, sure. Like many other foods that we regularly eat, pokeweed contains toxins when not prepared correctly or when picked too mature. That doesn't mean poke should be written off any more than you would write off toxic plants like potatoes, rhubarb, or nutmeg. Both the foliage and berries of potatoes are poisonous. Only the petioles of rhubarb are edible. The big green leaves are also toxic. An overdose of nutmeg is also toxic. But we understand how to use these plants, and no one would ever give you deadly warnings before consuming french fries, rhubarb pie, or eggnog. Pokeweed is maligned because of our ignorance, not its wanton deadliness. Poke contains toxic chemicals that aren't entirely understood. They're referred to as phytotoxin and phytolacin, but it's not clear if these terms refer to a specific chemical or are just used to describe the general toxins present in pokeweed. But the fact of the matter is, there just hasn't been a huge body of research on this plant that I know of, and since it's largely fallen out of our diets, I don't anticipate that there will be a huge push to explore it anytime soon. What is known from the traditional eating preparations around the world is that these poorly understood chemicals are removed or destroyed by the boiling process. What many of us pokeweed eaters depend on is the hundreds of years of eating and thriving on this generous plant. And I don't mean to be flippant about the risk involved, just realistic. These risks are largely due to ignorance and misunderstanding. If someone who didn't know how to drive a car got in one and crashed it, I don't think anybody would declare every car in the world to be a death trap. They would say that the person in question should have learned how to drive before getting behind the wheel. So why even deal with pokeweed? I guess if there's a potential for poisoning, why even deal with this plant? On paper, this question sounds valid, I suppose, but in practice it's short-sighted. I have gotten food poisoning from several restaurants, all of whom who were serving food that was normal and safe. The grocery stores are lined with so-called foods that are processed and chemically altered and packaged beyond recognition, but I've never gotten sick from poke. The simple fact is, pokeweed is an ample source of nutritious food that's available in the early spring well before the garden starts producing. It grows rampantly, doesn't care about soil quality, and can be harvested repeatedly. It merely requires knowledge before being consumed, something that anyone interested in self-sufficiency has the time to learn. Those who understand how to eat pokeweed understand how to live off the land just a little bit more clearly and need the grocery store just a little bit less.